Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Victor Mills, uh, Chief Executive of the Chamber, which means I'm Chief Vision Officer. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today and thank you for your company. I'm particularly delighted to welcome back our speaker this afternoon. He's one of Singapore's most distinguished and respected public intellectuals, a man who devoted many years of his life to purposeful public service for Singapore and for Singaporeans. And he's also a businessman. Please join me in warmly welcoming Mr. George Yeo. George, it is a pleasure to host you at the Chamber once again. My team and I and many people in the audience fondly remember our spirited dialogue when you were our distinguished speaker back in 2016. You've set the bar very high for yourself. George is with us this afternoon thanks to the enabling power of our member Brunswick Group, for which George is a senior advisor. I would like to thank Will Carnworth and Adrian Chung for exercising their enabling power to bring us back together with George. Will, who is a partner of the firm and head of the Singapore office, will be our moderator today. For those of you who may not know the Brunswick Group, it is a leading global critical issues advisory firm from the United Kingdom. The Group Singapore office was opened in 2016 and is focused on helping multinationals successfully navigate the critical issues they face in Southeast Asia, as well as supporting the region's leading companies with their national, regional and global expansion plans. Some weeks ago, Adrian very kindly gave me a copy of the firm's inequality report, which is one of the most thoughtful quality pieces of work I have read for some time. But let me return to today's topic, US-China relations and their implications for businesses operating in Asia. In a few moments, I will invite George to speak, after which Will will moderate our dialogue. As always, at any time during the webinar, you may type your questions into the Q&A function in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screens. You can also vote for those questions which most appeal to you and help make Will's job as moderator a bit easier. I will be back just before the end of the webinar to make brief closing remarks, but for now, it gives me great pleasure to invite Mr. George Yeo to address us. George, over to you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, thank you for your, for your kind introduction. I'm glad to be addressing the SICC again. Um, we are now living in an interesting period. I had expected um, bilateral relations between US and China to take a pause after the Biden win. Uh, but it seems to be not getting better. In fact, I think it's getting worse. And this may continue for a period of time. Um, partly because the Biden administration is more sophisticated, more subtle, better at working with uh, allies and friends. Uh, and China is responding in kind. I think most of us would have watched the rather feisty exchange uh, a few weeks ago in Anchorage. And after that, Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, flew to Kuiling in China for a bilateral meeting with Sergei Lavrov, uh, the Russian foreign minister. Um, after that, Wani went on a six nation tour of the Middle East. He went to Riyadh, uh, then he went to Tehran, uh, no, to Ankara, then to Tehran, then to the Emirates of Oman, and finally to Bahrain. When he was in Tehran, uh, China and Iran signed a, a 25 year strategic cooperation agreement which had been floating around as a draft for the last three years or so, which envisages 
uh, cooperation between China and Iran across all fields, including military technology, and also the establishment of a China-Iran bank, which presumably will uh, bypass uh, US sanctions and SWIFT. Um, after that, Wang Yi flew to Fujian, where a number of uh, ASEAN foreign ministers, including uh, Singapore's Vivian Balakrishnan, uh, went up uh, to have bilateral meetings with him. So what we're seeing now is the US putting pressure on China on many fronts. Through the Quad earlier, when they met at the summit level, there's the US, Japan, Australia, and India. And through various bilateral um, initiatives, Japan, uh, with Australia, with others. And, and most recently, uh, when the G7 foreign ministers met. And at that meeting, in the joint statement, there were seven paragraphs where the G7 uh, explicitly or implicitly uh, took issue with China on its adherence to a rule-based international order on the Xinjiang and Tibet, uh, on Hong Kong, uh, on, Tibet, on Taiwan's uh, uh, on the East and South China Sea, and on China's cyberspace behavior. It's the first time the G7 had, in a very deliberate way, laid out its case against China. Uh, everyone knows that it was the US which pushed, pushed this agenda. These seven issues minimum collective case against China. The Chinese are aware that in the coming years, uh, American pressure directly and through its various alliances and in various combinations, will be pressing on China. And the Chinese response is to, to develop an internal circulation economy, which is robust against external interference. And then around it, an external circulation economy, which they fully expect could be disrupted from time to time. The more they're able to preserve the integrity of the internal circulation economy, the more flexibility they will have in managing the external circulation economy. If you don't have the internal self-confidence, then when the US puts pressure on them, they will have to escalate to deter, which may in fact make things worse. Uh, which in some ways is Russia's response to Western pressure. Uh, some years ago, there was a threat to remove uh, Russia from SWIFT. And Putin had a one-line response. He said, well, that means war. And he left Dagnanis to think through what Russia could do in retaliation. And there are many things the Russians could do, which could be very disruptive to the US and to Western powers. But China doesn't want this tense situation because the Chinese and American economies are integrated at so very many points. Even the decoupling, the technological decoupling, which uh, many US strategic thinkers and policy makers think is necessary, uh, will be confined because even for many American technology companies, China is a bigger market than the US and they don't want to lose that market. What all this means is that in the coming years, the world will be more tense. Cold war. Well, it may not be a cold war, but he will certainly feel like a cold peace when it's not a war. 
And many of us, as countries, as corporations, even as individuals, find ourselves caught in between and are wondering what is the best way to, to position ourselves. And here I would like to talk about Southeast Asia, about ASEAN. ASEAN has seen China through its rise and fall over the centuries. So the rise of China causes ASEAN countries to go back to history, to have a sense of how China would behave and what the rise of China means for Southeast Asia. Most of the time, the rise, the rise of China meant prosperity for Southeast Asia because every time China became the world's biggest economy, it drove a very lucrative China trade, which swept through all of Southeast Asia all the way to Europe. It was at one such period that cities like Hong Kong and Singapore were established. And this new China trade, which we are seeing, and which will course through the new Belt and Road, will bring a new era of prosperity to Southeast Asia. But provided we're able to manage the geopolitical tensions, many companies are now looking at diversification from China. They can't pull out from China because it's too big a market and Chinese consumers matter a lot to them. But they don't want to be caught in the crossfire when there are trade disputes or when there's technological decoupling between the China and the US. If the US says you can't deal with China in this and the other area, then companies may have to choose or they may subdivide themselves. I remember how when there were Arab sanctions against those who dealt with Israel, the Japanese companies divided themselves into two groups, a small group dealing with Israel and a larger group dealing with the rest of the world. There'll be many such responses, but our best is in neutral. Others may be closer to one side than to the other. I mean, if you were Cambodia, Laos, you may be closer to China. And in fact, the fast train from Kunming to Luang Prabang will be open at the end of this year. All the tunnels have, have now uh, seen light. Uh, if you are Singapore, well, you have close defense links with the US or Australia, so you may tend in another direction. But collectively, for ASEAN as a whole, we can't afford to be divided. We cannot be highly integrated, like Europe, with taxes and subsidies. But we've always had variable geometry, which gave us flexibility when tectonic plates moved. And there's a stickiness in ASEAN, which tells us that, yes, whatever the tensions, don't break off. And I was not surprised that the, the Myanmar senior general, Ming, Ming Wan Lai, well, he turned up tail between hind, hind legs to the ASEAN summit in Jakarta. He knew he would get a year full, but he had to turn up. When I was a minister in the Singapore cabinet, as trade minister, as foreign minister, they always turn up. Leaders, ministers, officials, even though they knew when they came to the councils of ASEAN, they will be criticized, there will be tremendous peer pressure. But there's a deep instinct that better to go with ASEAN than to go with their larger neighbors or to bigger powers further away. That, that is the instinct of Southeast Asia. Even Vietnam, which has a love-hate relationship with China and courted by the US, 
as a kind of a counterbalance to China. There's a limit to what they would do. And two weeks ago, I followed with the greatest interest the visit by the Chinese Defense Minister, General Wei from her to Hanoi. There he met General Secretary Chong, he met President Fu, and, met, and he met his counterpart, the Vietnamese Defense Minister. But in his conversations with General Secretary Chong and President Fu, there were public statements that China fully supported, sorry, that Vietnam fully supported China's one China policy and opposes any attempt to subvert that. That Vietnam would not allow any external power to spoil the good relations between Vietnam and China. And in particular, the way they resolve their disputes in the South China Sea. I was somewhat blown away when I read the statements that were issued. I wondered how much the Chinese had to concede to cause the Vietnamese to issue those statements. Whatever, whether it is Vietnam or the Philippines or Laos or Cambodia or Myanmar or Indonesia or Singapore, there is an instinct that look, you can't afford to have China as an enemy. Of course, if China decides to be an enemy, then China will be an enemy. But you're not going to make China an enemy because somebody else tells you that you should make China an enemy. For this reason, I tell my American friends, if you ask people to choose between China and the US and Southeast Asia, you may not like the answer. I'm glad that Secretary Blinken has said more than once that no, the US doesn't require that. That at least is a public presentation. In private, the US continues to exert pressure. China in all its public statements sounds reasonable, objective and mellifluous, but China also exerts pressure. And those of us who are small fries in this game of titans, I mean, we, we, we know what we can do, what we cannot do. The best thing is not to be caught in between and to move to the side and triangulate very carefully. Naturally, people look forward to the future and ask themselves, in five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time, how would the future look? How do I position myself? When they look at China and the progress they're making across the entire continent and in all sectors, it is breathtaking. When they look at the US, when they see how Trump continues to wield enormous power within the Republican administration. And we're all wondering what the midterms will look like in the US. There's a sense that the country is divided and we don't quite know how long it will take for the divisions to heal, if they can ever be. So these are the, the considerations. My concern with current US approach is, it is too negatively obsessed with China. So when the US deals with a country bilaterally, the subtext is always, how can you work with me against China? And when people enter such a meeting, they don't have a good feeling. It used to be, that America represented something bright and shiny on the hill. Values you aspire to, a country you'd be proud to send your children for studies, an association which you flaunt, 
a lushness of heart which promoted free flow of students and researchers of trade. Well, we don't know how long the US will have to go through this period. It's a wrenching period for the US. But I hope the Biden administration will understand that you are better able to solve your domestic difficulties by having a positive foreign policy rather than one which is negatively driven. Sometimes I get the sense that this is like an F1 race where America is a lead car and the Chinese car is behind, threatening to overtake the US car. And the US car, instead of stepping on the accelerator and doing all it can, is move, busily moving side to side to prevent the Chinese car from overtaking. So when Biden said, I will not under my watch allow China to surpass the US. Well, whether or not China surpasses the US should depend on whether the US is able to revitalize itself with all its strengths and its access to global talent to push the frontiers of science and the global economy, not on how it's able to disrupt China's progress. So in the audience, there's a certain discomfort that this is not what the race should be. Unfortunately, this may be what it is, and therefore we may be in for a rather troubled period for some years to come. And here in Southeast Asia, we are price takers in the world. We just stay united, stay neutral, be friendly with everybody. If someone presses too hard from one side, then we lean a bit more to the other side, our balance, but otherwise do not likely side or the other. So, uh, uh, Victor, I have the floor to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, George, I can, uh, I hope you can oh, oh, hear. Oh, I'm sorry, Will, Will, Will will do this, I'm sorry. Yes. Will, yes. I hand over to you, yeah. Okay, I'll just try and turn on my video. I'm able. There we go. Yeah, it was a little uncomfortable for me to speak to a blank screen because no one, no one has put his image up. So I was talking to a, a blank screen, and it's rather a strange feeling. <laughs> now okay. I see you. <laughs> well, we're, we're all here, 90, 91 odd of us. Uh, we're listening in rapt attention. Um, thank you for the for those comments. I guess. Um, Plenty, plenty of cause for concern there, um, and, and rightly so. You, a couple of your comments that sort of caught my attention, particularly in light of previous discussions that, that you and I have had in terms of surprise that things have in fact got worse um, since the start of the Biden administration in terms of China-US relations and the, the feeling that the field, the world may indeed be more tense in the future than it has been in the recent past. Um, when we've spoken before, Bob Zollick, a, um, a, a colleague of both of us, has, has mentioned um, looking for what he calls off-ramps in this tense face-off. I just wondered, what are the mechanisms, channels and organisations that you see being sort of important assets for both sides in terms of rapprochement and seeking areas perhaps outside of trade where um, they, uh, they might find um, the ability to, to work together or at least to, to step closer together? Europe will play a key role in maintaining balance and honesty in the world. I was quite troubled by the G7 statement because you know, the Chinese remember the eight nation alliance against China uh, in response to the Boxer Revolt. And six of the eight countries involved in the eight nation alliance are members of the G7. So when the Chinese read a statement like this, the immediate association is with the Park Wally engine, the Eight Nation Alliance, which 
ravaged Beijing and the surrounding areas for over a year, and which extracted from China a crushing indemnity. Of course, the statement is nothing like that, but there's a feeling that, oh, these are the same people now come back to hurt us. Europe should not allow the G7, G7 agenda to become the European agenda. And Europe can say, look, yes, we have our differences with China, as we have our differences with the US. We share with the US similar civilization groups and naturally are many issues like human rights, like the, the way an international economy should operate. Uh, we should work together, but not say, well, I ally the US because I fear China's rise and I too will not want China to surpass the West. Because if China has that feeling, then the whole world will be cleft to do. And then it may become much uglier because the whole conflict then takes on racial overtones. So the wisdom of Europe here is so critical. China strategy, Joe's strategy is to support a strong Europe and to support a strong Euro. All above Europe, in Southeast Asia, we are minor pole, but we And if you push us too hard, you know, we are not so comfortable. So the Americans have kind of given up on ASEAN. The ASEAN can never become an ally of the US against China. The Americans are working on India. But frankly, I think they'll be disappointed because India is too big. India has too deep a history, too great a sense of itself to want to be made to itself. It will play its own game. And for this reason, if you watch the pattern of weapons, of sophisticated weapons purchased by the, by the Indians, fighter aeroplanes, rockets, they stick to Russia, Europe. They will buy some from the Americans, but they will never be as dependent on the Americans as let's us say Singapore is, or Japan is, or Korea is. So I think ASEAN can play a role, Europe can play a big role, I think India has instincts, so too Brazil. So, so even though some Americans may not understand this, the world is moving towards multipolarity. The US will still be primus inter pares, and we will still need the US as leader but you must accept that there are other poles and there will be a world of multiple systems. Thank you. Uh, just to, to, to pick up on your Primus Inter Paris um, point, um, one of the areas where, where the US has for a long time been first among equals was in terms of reserve currency. And uh, Elton Tan had a question about the digital yuan, your expectations for uh, how much of a threat the digital yuan poses to the reserve currency status of the of the US dollar? I'm very worried for the US. The, the way it is uh, printing money, as if there's no limit to the supply. Can you imagine if in your home you have a money printing machine? And any one of you, you your wife, your children, when they need it, can go to the storeroom and print, print dots. You would have destroyed your family. And I fear that increasing the money supply with minimal restraint will destroy the will to confront challenges and to overcome them. The world watches with concern, but it goes on. The game goes on. So asset price is US dollars. He doesn't mind because it, it is 
being printed. And in recent years, the weaponization of the financial system is creating great resentment among many countries. And sooner or later, there'll be a coalition She will say, look, no, we find a way to bypass this. And I believe that's one of the objectives of China's digital currency, one of the objectives. The other major objective is controlling corruption, which is endemic to the Chinese Confucianist system. But the Chinese are very careful to say, look, no, 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 this is not to displace the US dollar. This is not to replace SWIFT, far from it. We'll work with, with the US, we'll work with SWIFT. But precisely in the affirmation is the warning that, look, if you push too far, we have an alternative. So I don't see this continuing indefinitely. Sooner or later, a crack will appear in the cookie, but how it crumbles, who knows? No, thank you. Another area where, where the US has, perhaps if not led, certainly set the tone uh, along with Europe is on, is on climate um, and the environment. Um, you know, the reporting standards and um, the standards of corporate behavior and the huge shift we've seen in them over the last uh, five years. Um, a question from Ravi Alfreds about how, whether you see China perhaps catching up and surpassing um, the position of leadership that the US currently holds in terms of standard setting around um, climate and climate change. Frankly, I don't think China has a desire to, to lead the world in this initiative. Uh, its constant refrain is, we make the greatest contribution by looking after ourselves in terms of carbon emission and environmental protection. Because China is a continental nation, it is a big emitter, it's got a huge population, and if it can solve this problem for itself, it would have made a huge contribution to the rest of the world. So we'll find China very cooperative. It is good that under the Biden administration, they've got Senator Kerry come back to take the lead. He went to China, had good meetings there. And at least on this front, we'll see joint action and some progress. Okay, thank you. A question I'm going to uh, use my prerogative to ask you another question of my own, I'm afraid. There's a few questions around uh, defence, and so I'll try and wrap those up. Um, in terms of the, um, you mentioned the China-Iran 25-year strategic cooperation agreement. Um, I'll be interested to, to hear your thoughts on the rhetoric we can expect at the upcoming Shangri-La dialogue when we will see the first meeting between uh, US Defence Secretary General Lloyd Austin and Chinese Defense Minister Wei Feng Ho, who you've, you've already mentioned. What are, your, what are your expectations for the rhetoric that, that will or won't come out of um, that meeting? For the Chinese, if you run through the seven paragraphs in the G7 statement, the one which sticks out the most, it's not Xinjiang, because China will do what it feels it needs to do to curb Islamic extremism. It's not Tibet because there's tremendous economic development in Tibet. It's not the South China Sea, because I think eventually there'll be a resolve between ASEAN and China, and there's a good chance a code of conduct will be signed. If not this year, then maybe next year. It's not going to be trade, because there'll be a lot of argy-bargy around trade. It's not going to be about cyberspace, because regardless of what you say, countries will do what they do. And I don't believe China's a bigger perpetrator of cyberspace misbehavior in the world. It's not going to be the East China Sea uh, because Tiawi Island and what's going on around there, I think there's a kind of a more modest event die. It will be Taiwan. On Taiwan, if it's misplayed, the other side, there'll be war. And the Chinese will listen very carefully to what Secretary Austin will have to say about Taiwan and what's US intentions. 
the U.S. have uh, sent retired Obama officials there, which the Chinese have taken umbrage with. Uh, and they are telling the U.S., please don't push this because you know where it, it will lead to. And if the U.S. overplays Taiwan, I think there'll be a reaction from China. You'll, you'll find that the Chinese will freeze all cooperation with North Korea and China will begin to turn on the second stove in Iran. You mess around this side of the world, but let's see what happens in the other, in the other part of the world. Uh, so if Secretary Blinken has said, well, you know, we have relaxed some of the old restraints, self-imposed restraints, but we've put in stronger guardrails, stronger guardrails. I think the Chinese will be asking, oh, what are these stronger guardrails? And if, you, and if indeed there are stronger guardrails, which are forward of Chinese red lines, then there may well be stability. On a, a related question uh, from, from Victor actually was your thoughts on Biden policy on Taiwan to this point. Um, I just wondered whether you had any any sort of more points from the from the U.S. point of view about where you think they've uh, played it well or less well, and you know, building on your point about Secretary Blinken's comments. To me, it is it is it's a very stressful brinksmanship that we are watching uh, from the Trump administration into the uh, Biden administration. The U.S. is. Uh, play the Taiwan card. And the DPP is, is happy with it because it gives them more uh, maneuvering space and it gives them domestic political support until there's grief. So China has been deliberately intruding into airspace claimed by Taiwan and daring the Taiwanese to do something about it. And if the Taiwanese make a major wrong move, will be the last move. Now, the American Indo-Pacific Command has, I mean, this is not a secret, has thought through various scenarios. What happens if China makes a move on Taiwan? And it could be in response to a Taiwanese move. And say in, in a week, they occupy Taiwan. What would the US do? Would there be an exchange of aircraft carriers? Would there be bombardment of Chinese cities? Would there be nuclear weapons? And if there are nuclear weapons, is there a limit to it? So no one wants an exchange of cities. So the US, one reason why it's pulled out from the middle range accord with Russia is so that you, it can threaten to use medium range weapons in East Asia against China in the Taiwan scenario. And dare, China, and dare China to have an intercity nuclear exchange. <laughs> when people start thinking in those terms, I thought, God, they're playing with the planet. And the Chinese take it seriously. So last week or two weeks ago, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, Xi Jinping was in Hainan to launch three ships. One is a helicopter carrier because Taiwan is a hilly place and to tell the Taiwanese, I can land forces in quickly. So you think about it. Second is a destroyer which will increase the ability to move out into the blue ocean. But the third was the most interesting. It was a new submarine which can fire intercontinental ballistic missiles each with multiple warheads to cover most of the US. And while land-based missiles, you might arguably say, can all be detected and destroyed by the US in the first try. And even if China were to hide missiles in their complex of tunnels for railroads and highways, maybe the US has already identified the entrances to those tunnels and can seal those tunnels. But if these submarines are out at sea, that adds an additional joker in the pack. And that was the real purpose of Xi Jinping's visit to tell the US, don't play this. 
And can you, let's push the scenario further. Let us say China occupies Taiwan. So TSMC chip making capability will now be denied to the US instead of only being denied to China. Then what happens? And let us say, if in response to that, like in response to Putin taking the Crimea, there'd be 10 years of sanctions against China. I think the Chinese have thought through all these scenarios. And one reason why they have embarked on the dual circulation economy is partly in anticipation of such doomsday scenarios. I'm from the military. When I was in the armed forces, it was our business to think dark thoughts. But however dark the thoughts we thought, they are light com compared to the pitch dark thoughts being played out, being thought about in the Pentagon and in, in Tonganhai. I think that's, um, yeah, no, very sobering. Um, one of the one of the other things, and you, you've mentioned the dual circulation a couple of times, I think a lot of, at Brunswick, a lot of our clients are uh, considering what their posture would be in a bifurcated world. Do you see um, bifurcation being a, a sort of a corporate um, thing, as you've described with Japanese companies uh, wanting to work with Israel, or do you see it as a, as a much more holistic sense of, by China, developing a, a, a dual circulation economy, many of the other big economies in the world will have to do the same. Do you see that as a sort of its own arms race in terms of trade circulation? The key factor is China doesn't want an escalation. China's responses will be firm, will retaliate, but we won't escalate. The Huawei has effectively destroyed, sorry, the US has effectively destroyed Huawei's international handphone business. Well, not destroyed, but greatly diminished it. China could have easily taken action against the biggest market. I mean, it didn't have to ban Apple or do anything nasty. All it needed was to say, look, for Apple machines, you need to make one more you need to press one more button before you can effect a payment. Just add a little friction. That alone would have greatly affected Apple in China. But they say no. Welcome Apple, welcome General Motors, welcome Tesla, welcome whoever wants to work with us, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, please establish your offices in China. So their approach is don't escalate. And we talk about rare earths, but not yet and move proportionately, don't escalate, so that a cost is imposed and hope that one day the US will decide, look, maybe there's a better way to achieve a better outcome. But when that will, how long that will take, I don't know, I think it will take years. So some decoupling will happen, but you only be in the field of high technology, maybe in AI, maybe in supercomputers, maybe in the most sophisticated chips. But most computers, most chips will not be affected because there's too much money to be made by US companies. Yes. Um, thank you for that. Co coming back to, to, to more, I guess, strategic matters, a lot of the questions are, uh, seem to be focusing on this area. Um, Abishkek Bhatti had a question about the role of Quad, which you mentioned earlier, um, in ASEAN and, and with ASEAN. Do you, do you see a role uh, for, for um, cooperation and discussions between the Quad group and ASEAN as being um, as it develops? The Quad doesn't say it, but everybody says it, that the Quad is an alliance against China. Hmm. And ASEAN would not want to be a part of this alliance against China. It's too provocative. And even when the US and Japan started talking about the Indo-Pacific, uh, and occasionally uh, an Indo-Pacific of free and open nations, they all quote words 
to exclude China, to the credit of ASEAN and to Indonesian leadership, we say no. The Indo-Pacific is a geographical fact and an economic reality. But this is how we see and how ASEAN sees it. It's not how the US or Japan see it, sees it. Yeah. So the Quad at this point is a loose association. It is kind of a, a demonstration, uh, not yet too serious. Uh, I'm not sure how serious it will become. Uh, if it becomes very serious, the Chinese will respond. I think India will be the most reluctant. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more uh, question from Devadas Krishnadas. Um, Singapore hosts uh, the, the US 7th Fleet um, and provides support to them. What, in your view, would be um, the repercussions or challenges, perhaps, of, of in, in the spirit of even-handedness, trying to offer similar um, support to, to China? Lee Kuan Yew uh, made, made me make the announcement in parliament that Singapore was going to offer facilities to the US Navy and Air Force after the Philippines stopped the agreements on Clark and Subic. Um, and the reason why we wanted the US to have facilities here is because only the US could ensure that the Straits of Singapore and the Straits of Malacca would remain open to international shipping. So for us, that's our arterial lifeline and really of the greatest strategic importance to us. And that was the reason why we offered those facilities to the US. But I remember Lee Kuan Yew telling us very clearly, he says, if there's a conflict between the US and Taiwan, we are not gonna get involved. And I believe I've left government for over 10 years. I believe that remains a cardinal, cardinal principle. Now, the, the question is, do we only provide facilities to the US? It was never exclusive. I was a visiting scholar in Beijing after I left government in 2011, it was in November, I think. I went to the National Defense University, which, which was a closed campus. I, di I did not know. I went there in my jeans and carried my backpack and people started saluting me because I was a, I'm a brigadier general. <laughs> I felt so awkward initially, but I spoke about US-China relations from a Singapore perspective to senior officers from all three services of the PRA. And one stern looking officer put up his hand and said, you allow the US to use your basis, would you allow China to use your basis? Without pausing half a second, I said, of course. I said, you're welcome to use our basis. There was a few seconds pause and suddenly the whole audience applauded. But this is, this is Singapore's approach. The more the, the big powers are involved, the greater the assurance that the Straits of Singapore and the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea and the Andaman Sea will forever be open to trade, which means that we remain in business. And that's Singapore's approach. Of course, they don't need the kind of facilities which the US uh, forces need. Like I believe Chinese ships have uh, make use of our uh, make use of facilities here. So the Russian ships, and then recently there was a flotilla from London with a brand new aircraft carrier come steaming by, or it's, it's going to come steaming by. Someone said, look, isn't this hostile to China? I thought, but why? We are part of the five power defense arrangement with Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia and, and, and the UK. No, of course we welcome them here. It's also good business. <laughs> I remember once being invited by the US ambassador to board one of the aircraft carriers. And before boarding, I, I met a Singapore supplier and he was loading eggs. 
Say, how many eggs are you loading? There's so many of them. He said, uh, two million eggs. I said, two million eggs? I said, have you got a zero wrong? He says, no, no, two million eggs. So I did a rough calculation. 5,000 sailors, 100 days at sea. They're young men, say four eggs per sailor. There's two million. With none to spare. <laughs> so, so it's also good business for Singapore. Very good. Um, a question, uh, you know, we've talked a lot today about the rise and strength of China and indeed the sort of far reaching, uh, both in terms of history and the future reference frame that, that they use, which I think is, has often been a, a cause of misunderstanding uh, internationally. Um, David Ong had a question in terms of what are the biggest internal and external problems that you see for China that could put them back or indeed topple um, the status quo there? Throughout its history, it is China which destroys itself. And China is always destroyed by corruption. And corruption is endemic in the Chinese system because of Confucius. We are required to make gradations in our relationships. So when a mother decides whom to give red packets to a Chinese New Year, she makes careful distinctions between relatives, between seniors and juniors, young and old, closer and more distant friends. And then we ask our children, how much have you got? Because in this gift giving, we establish relationships. Beyond a point, the Ang Pao becomes a bride. Then it becomes a big bride. How does China overcome this? Because the emperor may disapprove, he may send his inspectors down, but how many inspectors can you have? Xi Jinping's greatest contribution to China is not in domestic policy or foreign policy, it is in this crackdown on corruption. It was getting very bad. It would have been the end of China if he had not turned it around. And he did it within a few short years. It's not 100%, it's only 50% done. But he reversed a tendency, and that tendency would have destroyed China. And they're hoping now that by using data analytics and by tracking the flow of money more accurately through the digital currency, that they can solve a problem which should bedevil all previous Chinese administrations that have corruption. Thank you. A question um, from, I know we're, we're running short on time now, but a, a question from Daniel Tio about, um, perhaps might be a little uh, delicate one for you to answer, what advice you might offer to the 4G leadership in Singapore in terms of uh, managing the balance um, between um, between China and the US. The internalization of this balance is not just in the prime minister or among senior ministers. I think it's in every Singaporean. You pull out anyone from the street and you ask him, how do you react to this, that or the other? And everyone knows, look, hey, we're in Southeast Asia. Yes, we may be three quarters Chinese, but we are in a Southeast Asia where the Chinese are in a minority and not always well treated. So better, better have a sense of proportion, better stay balanced, don't get carried away. So I have no doubt that 4G, 5G, 6G, that whoever runs Singapore will have a keen sense of the balance that's required. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from, from Victor, a sl slightly, uh, pessimistic tone perhaps, but um, saying that this year is the 50th anniversary of Nixon in China and the great coup that that represented. How have things deteriorated so far since then? Well, they're getting worse and I fear they will get more worse in the coming years um, until a point is reached where the US finds itself getting nowhere. And when the US softens, China will soften. 
because there is a strategy. They know they're getting stronger. It's not in their interest to precipitate a conflict. But if they are walkover, then the conflict will come earlier. So from the viewpoint of game theory, they always use this aphorism. They said, we don't want to fight, but we don't fear a fight. In game theory, it means if you try to push me to a win-lose quadrant, forget it. It's either a win-win or lose-lose. You decide. Mm. I, I guess a re related question in terms of the deep internal divisions we see in the US, will it require the healing of those um, divisions at least somewhat for a softening of the US position? China will inevitably be caught up in US domestic politics. If the Biden administration were to go soft on China, Trump's boys will go after him. And if Trump, Trump's boys were to go soft on China, well, the Biden people will turn it against them. So there's this mood in the US that China is the bogeyman. When will it change? It will change when the costs become high. It will change when it's not yielding results. It will change when Americans come to the conclusion that it's in their own interest to achieve some kind of a modest vivant die with China. And the Chinese should understand this. They should, and I think they do, make a very careful analysis of US domestic politics and without taking sides, be helpful. Don't be destructive. Don't make things more difficult for US politicians. Make it easier for them. That if China is not antagonistic, you'll find that your problems are easier to solve. Yes. I think perhaps in view of time, the final question before I uh, hand back to Victor, um, from, from Girja Pandey, who, who you've mentioned the US-India relationships and how the US's hopes in that regard may be um, a little optimistic. What's your sense of how the China-India relationship um, may develop uh, in, the, in the near and medium term? Well, right now, it remains very tense. Uh, the, the unresolved border demarcation uh, has bedeviled bilateral relations all these years and was the cause of the 1962 war, which was large, largely forgotten in China, but left a deep scar on the Indian side. And, and the 20 deaths suffered by the Indian army in the Gowan Valley last year, I think that that's reopened many old wounds. So India has retaliated on the broad front. China has not escalated at all. In fact, it, it's done nothing in retaliation because it's not in China's interest to have a rumpus with India. And the more they can bring relationship with India back to an even queue, they will try to. Um, but China sometimes also becomes a part of India's domestic politics. Uh, and right now, all political factions, all newspapers are anti-China. Uh, they are now going through hell with this pandemic. I think China is probably doing more than any other country to help India, uh, but, but this is gradually accepted and not well reported precisely because it's too difficult um, mm. for the Indian public to accept. But China's approach is, that's fine. We're not asking for publicity, but we are doing this as an earnest of a good intention. So that later on, when we sit down to have tough negotiations, you will have a sense of who we are. So I'm not pessimistic that the two sides will come to serious blows. I'm not saying that they will become chummy friends or that we're back to Chini Hindi bye-bye, you know, but, but uh, I think you'll be managed. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to, to everyone in the audience for um, some excellent and, and challenging questions. Uh, Victor, I, I think uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand back to you for some closing remarks. Thank you very much indeed, Will, and, and thank you, George, for another tour de force um, dialogue. Really appreciate 
your time, your expertise. And thanks again to Will for moderating and also for enabling us to come together again. It's been such a pleasure. I mean, the, the, uh, the amount of time and energy that people are spending talking about US-China relations is absolutely exceptional. Uh, it's the topic that comes to the top of many conversations and people you can see and sense the concern that people have um, and the hopes that they can get along so that we all can get along too. Thank you uh, for this wonderful opportunity to um, hear your thoughts. And on behalf of everybody at SICC uh, and our very engaged audience, I bid you all farewell and look forward to the next time. And we're going to make sure, George, that we don't wait five years before we have you back. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Victor. Thank you, Will. Thank you for this opportunity. You're most welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.